I am acutely aware that I've been giving quite a bit of love to Velamin lately, so let's change the pace a little bit. Pimeroni, it's your turn. Pimeroni is to Raspberry Pi what Velamin is to Arduino. They even provide libraries. Unlike Arduino, where the IDE only uses a variant of C++ to program, the Raspberry Pi is an entire computer capable of running many languages. The language of choice for most people is Python, so naturally the libraries for Pimeroni's modules are also written in Python. Well, that doesn't do me any good. I have nothing against Python, but for reasons that lie beyond the scope of this video, most of my projects wouldn't get any benefit from Python. I'm probably not going to write the library here because I don't really know what language I want it in yet, but should I decide to pull the trigger on a language, I'll need to know how this device works, so let's figure that out here. Where's the victim? Ah, the micro.piat. This module uses three AS31FL3730 chips to drive six LTP305 microdot modules on the front. The whole package occupies the same footprint as a Raspberry Pi Zero, and since the Raspberry Pi GPI header has become an industry standard, this module can be used on any single board computer that has the ubiquitous 40-pin header. Looking at the circuitry on this board, the chips appear to be the entire circuit barring a few bypass capacitors. Here is the datasheet for the IS31FL3730, and it is conveniently only 15 pages, so maybe it'll be pretty easy to dissect. This chip name, however, is not as easy to say, so I'll start calling it the FL3730. Right away, I can see the chip uses I2C to communicate with the MCU. At the top of the datasheet, there are a few typical application circuit schematics showing the wiring for different supported matrix layouts. This chip supports 8x8, 7x9, 6x10, or 5x11 matrices. So, which of these circuits most resembles the module's wiring? Well, the individual modules are 5x7, which doesn't help eliminate any modes. So digging a little further into the datasheet, I find this paragraph here. It appears the columns and rows for matrix 1 become the rows and columns for matrix 2, which means the mode used has to support both 5 and 7 in both directions. So now I'm left with the 8x8 and the 7x9 matrix modes. The Pimeroni website listing for the PHAT also says the module has a decimal place, which is probably in its own row or column, so now the only remaining supported mode has to be 8x8. Moving on, this page right here explains the I2C interface and addressing. With three chips, I need three different addresses to access each chip. Now this module has the addresses for each chip screen printed on the PCB, and the datasheet shows how these addresses are determined. This is the first chip I have personally encountered that uses the SEL and SDA lines to determine the address instead of using VCC and ground. I'm kind of curious how this works, but I'll have to look into this another time. Looking at the device from this orientation, the addresses are as follows. 63, 62, and 61. Remember, the addresses are actually only 7 bits followed by the read-write bit, which will always be 0 in this case because I don't need to read anything from the display. Now my I2C command is starting to take shape. I have a device address, now I just need a register and a byte to control the device. I'll start with register 00, or the configuration register. Here is a table showing the data byte and what each bit means. Starting at bit 7, SSD, I have no interest in software shutdown yet, so that can stay 0. Bits 6 and 5 are always 0, and bits 4 and 3 determine display mode. I want both matrices available, so I'll set them to 1-1. One, one. Bit 2 is for the audio input enable. As best as I can tell, the audio input is not connected, so that can stay 0. Finally, bits 1 and 0 determine matrix mode, which as discussed earlier is most likely 8x8, eight eight, so I'll put 0-0. Zero, zero. This leaves the first byte sent to address 0-0 zero, zero as binary 0-0-0-1-1-0-0-0, zero, 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 one, one, zero, 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 or hexadecimal 18. Now, conveniently, this chip auto-increments the address, and the next address is where I can start to write to display memory. Addresses 0, 1 through 0, B is where the data for matrix 1 goes. The starting address for matrix 2 is 0, E, so a stop command will have to be sent in order to write data to that display. There are two register addresses between matrix 1 and 2 that should probably be skipped instead of incremented through. The first register after matrix 1 is the update register, 0C, which allows the display memory to be output to the display. 
Until a zero is written to this register, the display will not output anything, and in order to show any changes to the display memory, this register also needs to be written to. The next register is the lighting effect register 0D. There are two groups of bits that make up this register. The first number, bits 6 through 4, define the audio gain. Since the audio pin is unconnected, it doesn't matter what value I put in here, so I'll just zero it out. The next numbers are for the current selection. These will define how much current gets driven through each LED. The more current passed, the brighter the display, the warmer the device could get. Heat can kill the LEDs, but I doubt the 75 milliamp max output will put out enough heat. Although I don't actually know, so I'll just have to keep a close eye on how warm the display gets. The decimal point took me a while to figure out. The pin pitch of the FL3730 was very tight, and the chip was packed pretty close to the displays. I was ultimately able to figure out where the decimal for this display on address 63 was connected, and use that to determine the location of the decimal place. Here is the matrix layout of each display, and the decimal LED runs from pin 7, the anode, to pin 9, the cathode, which from the bottom are these two pins. Tracing these pins out, I got a buzz out for them on the FL3730 as C8 for the anode and R7 or C10 for the cathode. Each LED can only have one C pin and one R pin, so the final hookup is C8 and R7. On the application circuit for the 8x8 matrix, there is only one LED that fits these constraints. This black LED here. But wait a minute, that would make this display two, so from the front each pair would be laid out like this. This will matter if I try to write something across multiple displays. The next thing to figure out is whether or not the columns and rows match up between the datasheets. By that I mean, does row 1 here correlate with row 1 here? If so, then the byte sent needs to have the lowest bit going towards the top or left depending on which display is used. So I sent a simple binary increment pattern with row 2 being 0 on both the displays. This allows me to positively identify the bit direction, and sure enough, this was the output, which means the columns and rows match between the datasheets. So for the decimal, that means matrix 1 will be a write of 80 at address 7, and matrix 2 will be a write of 40 at address 15. So let's draw something. How about the letter A? Since the first matrix in the module is matrix 2 at address 63, I'll select address 63, then write 00 for the register select, followed by 18 for the byte written. Then I'll stop the write. This configures the display. Now starting from register 0E, I need 5 bytes to write with the lowest 7 bits actually needed. Which makes the bytes I need to send 70, 0E, 09, 0E, and 70 in that order. Press stop and write 0C00 to display the output, which seems to have worked. Now to write A on matrix 1 is a little bit different. Looking at the A again, the bytes now only have 5 bits displayed. The start address for the matrix is 0, 01, so starting there, I need to write 04, 0A, 0A, 0E, 11, 11, and 11. Send the update command, and awesome. Now for this matrix, the decimal is on the same register as the last byte, so if I need that decimal, I can just add 80 to the intended write. Hex addition can get weird if you aren't familiar with it, but the internet has many helpful tools, like this calculator. There are only two more registers to look at. Register 19, which comes after matrix 2, sets the PWM for the displays. PWM can also control LED brightness and reduce current draw by cycling the LED on for part of an internal clock cycle and off for the rest. If bit 7 is 1, the display gives full intensity. But if bit 7 is 0, then bit 6 through 0 determine how long the LED stays on per cycle. I couldn't find out what the clock frequency was, but I suppose it doesn't matter because the clock is only handled internally. And the last register to look at is FF, or the reset register, which as implied resets all the registers when a zero is written to it. This reset includes the display data and all brightness and display settings. Going back to the configuration register, bit 7 or SSD defined the software reset operation. Thus far, I had been keeping it 0 for normal operation, but if I were to set it to 1, the display will enter a low power mode where all current sources are disabled. This turns the display off, reducing the current draw to as little as 1.7 microamps. 
The advantage of this is the display can keep updating without the excessive current draw. If the project had a limited power source because it was on a battery and the user only needed to periodically check the display, this could prolong the battery life letting the project run longer. There is also a hardware pin that appears to do the same thing, but just like the audio pin, this pin was not connected to anything, so I can't test it. A little warning about using the shutdown feature, the notes on the PWM register state that a shutdown, hardware or software, will reset that register. And that appears to cover all the features of the chip. I'll try to think of a language to write the library in, but that would make this video quite a bit longer, so I'll release another video about that. Right now, I'm leaning towards a command line library for the Raspberry Pi, but with the information that I found here, the language could be anything I have experience with. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.